Welcome to the License to Lead podcast. I'm Patty Fay. This podcast is for physicians or anyone who thinks healthcare needs a transformation led by physicians. License to lead means that physicians are charged with and must be in charge of guiding the vision and the culture of healthcare systems. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 24 of the License to Lead podcast. In this encore episode, I'm revisiting a few select excerpts from a previous deep dive into the topic of burnout. We are rocketing towards the first ever End Physician Burnout Global Summit, August 24th through 26th. There are over 50 speakers from Ariana Huffington to, yes, you guessed it, Patty Fay. I'll put a link in the show notes and more information about the summit. Okay, let's jump right into this encore episode. Here we go. We have clear and convincing descriptions of the causes of burnout. We don't have a lot of action directly tackling those causes. Why are we so stuck? If you've been listening to the License to Lead podcast so far, you'll know that the flag I wave is the lack of physician leadership of our healthcare systems, the lack of physician autonomy, and a pernicious BSM, business school mindset. The business school mindset embraces managerialism, monitoring and measuring with financial tools that care not one bit if the organization is a startup with a new app, a big box hardware chain, or a safety net hospital. Managerialism prioritizes profits over patients and treats physicians like commodities that must be monitored so throughput and revenue collections can be maximized. And you know what? We've been sitting on this for 20 years. A 2003 JAMA article titled Change in Career Satisfaction Among Primary Care and Specialist Physicians looked at physician career satisfaction from 1997 to 2001. The authors, Bruce E. Landon et al., explained the real causes of doctor dissatisfaction. Quote, Rather than declining income, threats to physician autonomy, to their ability to manage their day-to-day patient interactions and their time, and to their ability to provide high-quality care are the most strongly associated with changes in satisfaction, close quote. The 2013 RAND study was excellent and thorough. The top two findings were that docs were thwarted in their ability to provide high quality of care to patients and that the dysfunctional EHR was problematic. The study gave us a map and a destination, and we could have been on the right road for the last seven years. An area that makes my eyes glaze over is the bureaucratic undecipherable language and hopeful generalizations of white papers, position papers, commitments, calls to action, and charters. They don't state in clear, concise language what must be done, why, when, and by whom. We know the biggest causes of burnout in practicing physicians. So if we're going to do an intervention, let's start with what's been proven and corroborated, like concrete issues such as doctors being thwarted, not supported in patient care, and the frustrating time sink of the EHR, right? And yet the burnout literature continues to be filled to the brim with studies and articles looking at resilience training, coaching, small group work, and mindfulness training. Usually, these solutions are presented right after a disclaimer about how burnout is, of course, an organizationally caused syndrome, and the most effective solutions will be focused on fixing the organization, not the doctor, then onward to fixing the doctor. A couple of physicians took exception to a JAMA article about one-to-one coaching as a strategy to reduce burnout. The article was titled, Effect of a Professional Coaching Intervention on the Well-Being and Distress of Physicians. And three of the article's authors were the prolific burnout and wellness researchers, Drs. Derby, Shanafelt, and West. The two physicians wrote a letter to JAMA, and their critique perfectly addresses the issue. Quote, We believe physicians with burnout are primarily victims of a healthcare bureaucracy that takes advantage of clinicians' dedication to patient care, often at the expense of their own well-being. Physician burnout is largely a result of the policies of institutions, not a lack of stress management skills, close quote. The letter writers are a couple of anesthesiologists from Stanford, and they go on to point out the cure for physician burnout should primarily focus on restoring direct physician control over the practice of medicine. 
I picked on this coaching article, but it's one of many that confuse the issues around burnout and contribute to the fact that we're stuck, not making any progress in addressing burnout, but just fiddling around the edges and then measuring it again. These little interventions are easy to set up, easy to measure, easy to arrange, easy to fund, and glory be, easy to get published. On the other hand, the known causes of burnout are messy, expensive, and probably politically dicey to study. Next up, I talk about well-being, motivating factors, hygiene factors, and I introduce Dr. Shriver. Well-being language, not necessarily well-being itself, but the language is metastasizing all over the place, so it does deserve a special focus. You've likely been exposed to well-being concepts, initiatives, surveys, and even some new well-being executives. I think the well-being and wellness proponents are missing an important point. Well-being and burnout are not opposite ends of a continuum. Having gas in your tank and not having gas in the tank are on a continuum. Or having light in your room and not having light in your room is on a continuum. Well, if you have a dimmer switch or if the sun is going down, it's on a continuum. Otherwise, it's dichotomous, but you get the picture. Well-being and burnout are related and lack of well-being and burnout show up together, but they're not on a continuum. The opposite of burnout is not well-being. It's the absence of burnout. You can have no elements of burnout, but not be in a state of well-being and vice versa. Frederick Hertzberg is famous for making this point in his classic HBR article called One More Time, How Do You Motivate Employees? He described hygiene factors and motivating factors. He said hygiene factors are those things that cause dissatisfaction at work and motivators are those things that cause satisfaction and that motivate people. Time wasting inefficient equipment, salary inequities, inflexible policies and disrespectful supervisors, these are dissatisfiers or what Hertzberg called hygiene factors. And when you address or resolve hygiene factors, you just get up to neutral as far as workplace satisfaction. And if you don't get up to neutral by fixing the broken hygiene factors, don't bother with motivators. Recognition or other motivating efforts won't help and might hurt if you haven't fixed the hygiene factors. And when it comes to motivation, you can't get there from here if your supervisor is disrespectful or your salary is unfair. So fixing hygiene factors does not motivate employees. And importantly for this discussion, adding motivators or wellness initiatives doesn't fix hygiene or burnout factors. So if the number of clicks, pre-authorizations, and clerical tasks are exhausting or even disgusting, wellness interventions are not going to help. A wonderful March 2020 JAMA article titled Professional Dissonance and Burnout in Primary Care with lead author Sumit Argawal used focus groups to identify sources of burnout and notably to identify solutions. To this point about well-being efforts, the authors said, quote, Participants uniformly agreed that personal training in resilience was not something they needed, close quote. What these physicians did need, just like their primary care colleagues all over the country, was help overcoming the organizational barriers to taking excellent care of patients. Sumit Argarwal and his three co-authors, all from Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, identified areas causing dissatisfaction and burnout, and they detailed eight specific areas for intervention. Another article that I thought was excellent zeroed in on the hygiene factor versus motivating factors and the parallel we see with burnout and well-being. This was a 2016 study with lead author Iris Shriver from Stanford. Using survey data and focus groups, the researchers dug into the nature of the physician's experience, including their experience of well-being versus burnout. Shriver at all made the point that for physicians, intrinsic motivation and fulfillment are intrinsic to their profession, but external pressures can frustrate doctors in their efforts to provide care, and that gives rise to burnout. Quote, thus, prevention of burnout and increasing physician wellness become somewhat separate targets that benefit from different, albeit complementary, approaches, close quote. This is important because I think this basic misunderstanding underpins many of the formal wellness programs and well-being initiatives. Why else would there be such a lack of concrete funding and rock-solid initiatives to address the very clear causes of burnout? It's like what's being said is administrative work overload, barriers to taking care of patients, and the EHR are huge problems. And what is being heard is we need a wellness program, more studies about resilience, and for sure a chief wellness officer. 
In healthcare, at least, causes of burnout are specific. To mitigate burnout, you have to address the specific factors that are right there in your face causing the burnout. And well-being factors are general. To increase well-being, there are lots of options. We can compare burnout to cardiomyopathy or heart failure. Heart failure is not the opposite of physical fitness. Heart failure is specific and requires clear, sometimes dramatic, and expensive interventions. On the other hand, physical fitness is a general state related to well-being and which presupposes the lack of a life-threatening illness. And people can arrive at physical fitness in a huge number of ways. All kinds of diet, exercise, and lifestyle programs will improve someone's fitness. But if they start out with a cardiomyopathy, the need to attend to the life-threatening condition is obvious. Burnout, like a cardiomyopathy, is career-threatening, health-threatening, and in extreme cases, life-threatening. Its causes need to be addressed. So why do wellness coaches, well-being committees, and chief wellness officers seem set on tackling burnout by increasing wellness? Well, hell, well-being is a piece of cake. It's joy and music and self-actualization and that profound quiet you can experience after meditation. Who the heck wouldn't want to be a chief wellness officer, provided, of course, that well-being initiatives are actually what's needed and wanted. However, it's probably not quite as attractive if the job that needs doing, and I think this is the job that needs doing, is a crusade against the structural defects that trap people into a daily routine of illegitimate work that allows no recovery from the all-out sprint of a chaotic practice. If the job is figuring out a fix to the budget-sucking behemoth EHR or figuring out how to give physicians actual time to think as opposed to teaching them to be more resilient given the fact that they have no time to think, or if it's taking on the CFO who thinks he's the only grown-up in the room who likes to say, now, now, Dr. Fay, the pie is only so big. If the job is those things, the list of eager candidates for chief wellness officer might dwindle. Certainly the likelihood of success will dwindle. Why? Well, who could handle that responsibility? There's only one position where the odds of success are good, and that's the CEO. Securing an adequate budget, taking on the business school mindsets in the C-suite and on the board, where, frankly, the members may not see that there is a problem, that is not what wellness officers appear able to do. There's that joke about the guy who lost his car keys in a dark alley, and he was out on the street under a big streetlight, frantically hunting for them, when a buddy comes up and asked him what he was doing. So he explained, and his buddy said, if you lost them in the alley, what are you doing looking for them here? And he said, well, because this is where the light is. I'm afraid when it comes to burnout, physician career, the dysfunctional technology, the business school mindset prioritizing profits over patients, we got a bunch of people looking under the streetlight trying to find the easy answers, avoiding the threatening and difficult unknown where the real answers are. The leaders are issuing position papers and commitments, creating new administrative infrastructures, building out vast websites with training and development curriculum, and fostering robust research careers all based on looking in the wrong place for answers to what's destroying medical careers. Our hospitals and healthcare systems have the wrong leadership by definition if they haven't aggressively tackled burnout. The current state has been created and sustained by these leaders, whether they're physician leaders or not, and they're not evil, they are the status quo. As Deming said, every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. If we want different results and different systems, we need new leadership. Over the last few decades, medicine has shifted to a model where approximately 95% of hospitals and healthcare systems are run by non-physicians, usually people with business degrees. Over this same period of time, what have we seen? Commoditization of the profession, discounting of the value of other staff and clinicians, an extraordinary profit motive with supersized salaries among CEOs, Byzantine billing practices which confuse patients by obscuring real costs, and decades of disregard for physician burnout. 10 healthcare system CEOs and the CEO of the American Medical Association put their heads together to discuss burnout. And then they published, Physician Burnout is a Public Health Crisis, a Message to Our Fellow Healthcare CEOs. And this was published in 2017 in Health Affairs. The fact that this was called a call to action is downright cringeworthy. They presented their call to action by saying, quote, addressing the issue of burnout is a matter of absolute urgency, close quote. 
there was not a real action item on the entire list. Here's a follow-up comment from a physician on the Health Affairs website. Quote, measure, evaluate, emphasize, encourage, educate, track. My word, are you physicians or not? Have you forgotten how to fix anything? Well, for the record, four of the CEOs were not physicians. But this was a list of 11 items under the title CEO Commitment and Call to Action. And I'm not making this up. The first three were regularly measure the well-being of our physician workforce where possible. Now, this is number two, where possible, include those measures in performance dashboards. And number three was evaluate and track the institutional costs of physician turnover and retirement. Here's another comment from a physician on the Health Affairs website. Quote, But why have physicians lost autonomy, lost control over their own work, become subject to quality measurement that often lacks a good evidence base and that fails to measure most of the important aspects of medicine and become forced to use badly designed and implemented EHRs? I don't see any answers to those questions, close quote. What was utterly missing from this list is any action items to clearly fund and address the known factors causing burnout, for instance, or any alarm about managerialism, the institutionalization of a profits over patients mindset that drives the cynicism and moral injury. There was no mention of physician leadership or physician autonomy or authority, for instance, the needs for physicians to have a level of authority commensurate with their level of accountability for outcomes and a level of authority commensurate with their level of responsibility to patients. What might this list look like if it was more interested in advancing the cause of excellent patient care and excellent physician career? Well, I'll take a stab at it. Number one, we, the undersigned CEOs, commit to sharing our annual physician burnout and satisfaction data, as well as the level of investment and the interventions to address burnout. Number two, at each of our 10 systems, we've committed a million dollars for initiatives in the next 18 months to knock down barriers in primary care departments. Number three, implement a best practice scribe program in at least 25% of primary care practices within 18 months. Number four, survey the extent to which physicians agree that they're doing physician work and that they're well supported to provide a high quality care to patients. Number five, intervene to improve departmental leadership if burnout rates exceeds 32%. Number six, 20% of our CEO compensation will be placed at risk based on three specific organizational burnout targets. Number seven, CEOs will share all above mentioned measures and results. Number eight, all the assessments and interventions and measurements and results will be reported in a standardized format administered by a third party and published on an independent website created for this purpose. All right. So after I took the red pen to the CEO's call to action on the burnout crisis, I wrapped up the episode with a few more suggestions. Here are some recommendations. Number one, to the researchers, use the data about organizational causes of burnout to create your studies to intervene in addressing burnout. Stop looking under the streetlight for the easy, cheap, and very publishable answers Stop already with the wheelbarrows full of articles slicing and dicing burnout statistics or doing detailed statistical analyses just because you can. These efforts have opportunity costs and they confuse the issues about the etiology of burnout and they dilute the important studies focusing on eliminating the organizational causes of burnout. Number two, to the well being proponents and organizational leaders. Well, I guess we're all well-being proponents. I'm just not a well-being initiative proponent when there are structural barriers in place causing burnout and driving physicians away in droves. I'd say please stop with all the well-being recommendations in the face of physicians who are double booked during the day and doing data entry at night and who are otherwise relentlessly commoditized. Please shift to going after the sponsorship and the budget to transform the leadership and autonomy of physicians, transform the workflows and work lives of physicians so that they become well-supported leaders of high-functioning teams and replace the EHR with technology that creatively and amply supports, no, enhances the physician-patient relationship. 
Number three, for medical school and residency leaders and deans, I addressed these issues in podcast episode number six. We know viable proven alternatives to the status quo that reduce anxiety, burnout, and harm and increase adult learning. Again, what's missing is adoption and implementation. Stuart Slavin's June 2019 article in Academic Medicine is a great place to start. Every dean and medical school leadership team should be pressed to implement the known interventions that reduce stress and increase adult learning in medical school and residencies. That's a wrap on episode number 24 of the License to Lead podcast. I appreciate you listening to this Encore episode. I chose the topic of burnout as a lead-in to the Ending Physician Burnout Global Summit, August 24th through 26th. I'll be giving a talk at noon Mountain Time on August 25th. The title of my talk is Incompatible, The Business School Mindset and the Medical Profession. I will put links and more information in the show notes. And if you're in the market for an idiosyncratic array of information and titillating news, and even a peculiar column titled the Big Fat Opinion Column, I have got just the newsletter for you. So sign up for that. And as always, thank you for all of your care and caring. Thanks for listening to the License to Lead podcast. Be sure to visit licensedtoleadpodcast.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and sign up for our newsletter. Leave us a message with your provocative question or your thoughtful comments. You might inspire a future episode of the License to Lead podcast. Thanks so much, everyone.